thank you, Manos. That was a fantastic first session. Um, I'm going to kick off the second session and we can claw back a bit of time. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker uh, from the US, um, who is Professor Peter Katzmark. Um, Peter is a professor and associate executive director for population and public health sciences at the Pennington Biomedical Research Centre, where he also holds the Marie Adena Corcoran Endowed Chair in Paediatric mm. Obesity and Diabetes. Um, Peter's had an instrumental role in both the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans as a committee member, and also the WHO 2020 Physical Activity and Sedentary Behaviour Guidelines Development Group. Um, so, Peter, it's a great pleasure to to hand over to you, and really looking forward to your to your talk. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, real pleasure to be here today to discuss this topic. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, okay, slideshow on. Is that all right, Manos? Mark, can you see that? Okay, yes, good. Yes. Well, um, yeah, great to get started here. Uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about the um, physical activity guidelines for Americans and how we handled the uh, issue of device-based measurement of physical activity. Now, just uh, by way of background, the, the, the way they develop guidelines uh, in the United States, the federal guidelines, is by appointing a uh, advisory committee who generates the evidence base and generates the report. So on the left here, you see the 2018 Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee Scientific Report. And this covers all the methodology and provides all the evidence that, were, that was presented and uh, collected by the committee. Then we turn this over to the feds and uh, they actually developed the guidelines. So on the right-hand side, you'll see the actual guidelines for Americans. This is the, they're called the second edition because the first edition came out in 2008. So uh, again, I, I was a member of the committee. I'm not speaking on behalf of the committee. I'm just um, giving you my, my highlights here today. Um, kind of some takeaways from my involvement. I wanted to first just kind of lay out the timeline so everyone can understand where we were at the time. So, uh, you know, they put the notice in the Federal Register in December of 2015 that these guidelines were going forward. And you'll see that the committee had five different public meetings here over time in these yellow boxes. And in March of 2018, we submitted our report. Now, I also added on here that, and I think this is important, the cutoff for the literature searches that were done was in early 2017, generally, January, February, for most of the, most of the subcommittees. So the evidence that the Physical Activity Guidelines Committee had to work with was all conducted prior to 2017. And that'll put it in, into kind of a perspective for you. And just a little bit on our process, so you can see how we gathered the evidence and assessed the associations. The, the first step was to develop the topics, the questions, and then to prioritize the questions. And you see here, the P represents the PAGAC, and this is a short form for the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee. So the entire committee was involved with developing these questions and prioritizing them. From that point forward, we broke into subcommittees, which are represented by the S. And the subcommittees were responsible then for doing the systematic review process and developing the search strategies, abstracting the data, um, and developing the evidence portfolios. This was all done by the subcommittees. Then we came back and you'll see the bottom line here, the, um, the P is back. So the entire committee then was uh, involved in kind of grading the evidence, drafting the chapters and, and approving everything. So while the work of different topics was, was conducted by the subcommittees, 
the full committee approved all of the grades and all of the evidence. And uh, I just wanted to show you how we graded the evidence so you'll understand when I talk later about strong evidence, moderate, limited, or grade not assignable. You'll see that we have these criteria down the left-hand uh, column here. Um, like applicability, generalizability, risk of bias, uh, consistency, the association, et cetera. We, we used these criteria to judge the strength of the evidence. For example, for the association between physical activity and heart disease. And so you'll see where we had strong evidence. It's based on all these criteria and we had to meet all the criteria to say that we have strong evidence of association on the far right side, you'll see the grade not assignable. And this is where we really didn't have any evidence to, to make any kind of statement of any kind. And you'll see that come up uh, when we talk about some device-based evidence. So just quickly, uh, an example from the sedentary behavior subcommittee. These were the questions that we addressed. So you'll see that there were five major questions and we therefore then, you know, after the questions were developed, you know, we developed search strategies to search for evidence to answer these questions. All of the subcommittees basically had these uh, four sub questions related to dose response, um, whether the relationship varied by these kind of different characteristics. Uh, this, the sedentary subcommittee had two more um, related to breaks. Uh, and bouts of sedentary behavior, as well as whether the association was independent of light, moderate, or vigorous physical activity. So we would then set off after the questions were set and to try to find evidence using in a systematic way to answer these questions. So I think it's important to understand, particularly given the topic today of device-based measurement is the types of evidence we relied on in the committee was number one, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. This was our primary source of evidence for most of the subcommittees. The second level, if, you know, if, we, if we found that there was not enough um, evidence in these systematic reviews or not enough meta-analyses, then we would revert and go after original research studies. And we did that for the sedentary behavior committee, because as you know, you know, around the time of the 2017, there were a lot of papers coming out on sedentary behavior and mortality. And if we had only uh, relied on the meta-analyses, we would have missed a lot of evidence. Now, one thing to mention here is that we generally did not consider cross-sectional evidence. However, as you might expect, some of those systematic reviews and meta-analyses had cross-sectional evidence embedded within it. So it was very hard to tease that out because it was just blended in with everything else. And the same could be said for the device-based measures. You may have had a systematic review that, that covered everything. You know, it could have covered the questionnaire-based and device-based and they blended it all together. So that's kind of the, these are the main types of evidence we relied on. So uh, with the cross-sectional evidence kind of set aside, the two main designs we had were prospective cohort studies and intervention trials. I wanted to mention this because it'll become important when we look at uh, the role the device-based measurement may have played. So the prospective studies informed questions of the associations between exposures, like physical activity and sedentary behavior, and all of the different health outcomes. So these are the prospective cohort designs. And of course, we look for evidence of association evidence of a dose response association and all of that. Now the intervention trials, they inform questions related to the alterability of physical activity, you know, in the case where physical activity was an outcome. You know, for example, there was a section on promotion of physical activity. And so that chapter really looked at all the evidence on can we, can we modify physical activity through these interventions. Also, we looked at changes in intermediate outcomes, such as BMI and blood pressure and glucose and all these sorts of things. So these are the intermediate 
uh, outcomes. So that those are the primary two study designs that most of the subcommittees relied on. So with that in mind, how does the, the method of measurement or the estimation of physical activity fit into this evidence base? So the measurement method, i.e. self-reported versus device-based, in a, in a cohort study, it really has to do with the measurement of the exposure, physical activity, sedentary behavior, et cetera. Um, you know, if there were studies that use longitudinal data to look at changes in activity over time or predictors of that change or uh, tracking of activity, you know, from childhood through adolescence, for example, um, it was kind of measuring both the exposure, like the early assessment of activity, and then also the outcome. So the device-based measure could influence the results of those types of studies in that way. Intervention studies, again, if we're looking at, can this intervention change physical activity? You know, the, the outcome of those studies is change in activity. And of course, in that case, the device-based versus self-report could have an impact on those results and how you interpret those results. Also, um, many interventions may have included a pedometer or an accelerometer to measure the dose. You know, if they prescribed, for example, 30 minutes of activity per day, uh, and they would give someone a pedometer, they could also look at the adherence to that intervention, the fidelity of it. Um, and also, you know, some studies looked at outside activity beyond the intervention. So in this case, in the intervention studies, you know, you could, uh, depending how you want to measure it, um, uh, the device base could have an impact um, on that assessment. So I just put here one kind of concrete example where we would rely on device-based assessment of activity. This was a question that was addressed. What is the relationship between step counts per day and all-cause CVD mortality, as well as the incidence of CVD and type 2 diabetes? So <laughs> in most cases, if you're looking at step counts, you're looking at a device-based measurement, right? You're not gonna ask someone to count the number of steps or try to recall the number of steps they took each day. So this is one example where we certainly were looking for device-based measurement of activity through step counts. And the conclusion statement here uh, for number one is there is insufficient evidence. And you remember that's the far right side of our evidence uh, uh, strength. So there, there's insufficient evidence available to determine whether a relationship existed between step counts per day and mortality. So we could not assign that grade. There was limited evidence suggesting that step counts were associated with incident CVD and type two diabetes. And this was very, the grade was limited in that case. And on the next slide, I'll show you why. So the evidence on steps, at that time, 2017 and earlier, there were no studies found that examined the association between step counts per day and mortality. So we were unable to get any kind of conclusion on that question. Now, of course, today, you know, we see these studies coming out now, step, step, steps per day and mortality and all these sorts of things are becoming more prevalent in the literature, but not back in 2016, uh, 2017. They found actually five longitudinal studies looking at the association between step counts per day and disease incidence. There was one for CVD and there were four for diabetes. So that was essentially the extent of the evidence base at that time for step counts per day and um, disease outcomes. Now, when we switch over to the question of sedentary behavior and mortality, um, we had found actually 13 studies at the, at the time. And again, this we went back to the original research base where we found a lot of these because they were all just kind of coming out around 2016, 2017. 13 studies on device-based sedentary behavior and all-cause mortality. So 11 of the studies were from NHANES. And actually 10 of the 13 studies reported a significant 
association. Eight out of the 11 from NHANES. So the three studies that really didn't find a strong association were all from NHANES. And those three studies, they were all, there's something different about them. You know, they were looking at different kind of sub cohorts within NHANES. You know, one was about visual acuity and whether that moderated or modified the association and, and stuff like that. But 10 out of 13 studies reported a significant relationship. And overall, the results of the device-based uh, measures were similar to those for self-report. And it didn't impact our conclusions at that point. As you may recall, that the PAGAC did not recommend specific cutoffs for sedentary behavior. There were general questions in there about you know, minimizing sedentary behavior, replacing sedentary behavior with light and moderate activity, but we didn't actually have a cut point. You know, therefore the device-based versus self-report didn't really come into play at that time. So uh, I just wanna show this. This was the evidence we did have. You know, this is a, a pooled analysis of six different prospective cohort studies. This is a figure from the PEGAC. And you know what we see over time, there's, uh, this is an annotated graph. We see that about 70% of the benefit was reached here at about 8.25 met hours per week. And if you look at the range of 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity here shown in the bottom, this is kind of where, that's kind of the sweet spot where the recommendations are. But if you go to the top left, it says there's no lower threshold for benefit. And this was highlighted very much in the guidelines that you know, any activity is good. And even if you don't hit that threshold of 150 minutes, you're still getting benefit from doing physical activity. And so that's what that looks like. And now what I've done, I've taken that same figure, I've, I've kind of highlighted in red that range that the committee was looking at, you know, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity on the left. This was based on pooled analysis of six self-reported studies. Let's switch over here to the right. Uh, this was something we did not have at the time, but the question is, would, would, our, would our recommendation have been different? Well, uh, this is in, you know, the uh, x-axis is minutes of moderate to vigorous activity. And I've highlighted here in red where that 150 to 300 minutes per week would be. And what we see is that, again, this is, this is where it's, it's at a similar point on the curve. It's a little further down. But, you know, I question whether our recommendation would have been any, anything really different. You know, that curve looks like it's going up a little bit at the end. You know, there's an upward slope to it. But um, as we heard from Jacob today, there's only about a couple data points out in that range. So we're not too sure about that. And also, if you look at where the hazard ratio of one is, and that upper point of the 95% confidence interval, once you hit 300 minutes, the association is no longer significant out past 300 minutes. So, Again, this is not evidence we had to look at, but if you compare the two figures, you know, would we have changed our mind? You know, I'm not too sure that the device base would have changed anything. Moving on to look at sedentary behavior briefly. Um, on the left is a meta-analysis of 14 studies. Only three were device-based. They were blended in with everything else. And the authors point out eight hours as a potential cutoff. This is where they saw an increase in risk, really a change in the slope. On the right is um, a meta-analysis of the eight device-based measures. And those authors selected a point of 9.5 hours where they see increased risk. And the reason it's 9.5 is if you look at that lower bound of the 95% confidence interval, that's where that association becomes significant. It, that it's above one at that point. So two different interpretations are coming up with about eight or nine and a half hours uh, at that uh, point. But again, the committee didn't have any of this evidence at the time. 
So physical activity interventions, this was another area where device-based measurement came into play. And in terms of physical activity promotion, there was strong evidence that wearable activity monitors uh, used in conjunction with goal setting and other behavioral strategies help increase activity. And six of the seven systematic reviews that examined physical activity used device-based measures as that outcome. So we have good evidence for this. So closing thoughts. Um, as of early 2016, we had very few meta-analyses or systematic reviews that included device-based measurement. When they did, they were typically rolled in with the self-reported data. They weren't handled separately. So we had very few studies at that time um, to really influence the evidence base. And because of this, this lack of device-based studies, it offered very few opportunities to explore the health benefits of light intensity physical activity, for example, which are often missed by the self-reported data. So you'll note that light intensity activity wasn't addressed to any great extent in the guidelines. So where we are today, it's very exciting to be here and talk about this. We have this recent explosion of research in device-based measures. So the next edition of the physical activity guidelines will definitely have to figure out a way to incorporate this evidence into the, uh, into the base. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. And you are absolutely bang on time, which is fantastic. Um, 